So um, yeah, my name is Peggy Doty. I actually work in unit two, it's Boone to Calvin Ogle. So I'm like one county away from Wisconsin sitting here today. And this is a new program for me and I was excited. My first uh, degree, my bachelor's degree was from Southern Illinois University down by where Chris and Aaron are sitting today. And I got my degree in wildlife management and wildlife management studies in the eighties, uh, don't do the math. Um, we were focused on sustaining families still. When we did wildlife management, we were looking at population dynamics and how we could sustain populations of fur bearers. That was my, my focus was fur bearing mammals to feed families and to also bring in income uh, in, the, in the case of furs. So things have changed a lot. We now tend to manage uh, people in wildlife. And in this case, this goes back to my heart of, of sustaining wildlife uh, where they belong. So. Uh, we're going to go through and talk a little bit about um, how these nest boxes can help your property, how they can help conservation, and potentially in the uh, and they have in the past save species. There we go. It might go twice. All right. So I put this up because one of the definitions of conservation is here, and the last piece of that um, is that prevent exploitation, destruction, or neglect. If you own property, I feel that it is on you as, a, as the conservationist of that property to find out what you can do to sustain species that should be there. In the case of nest boxes, it's directly related to the loss of our forests. Uh, we, didn't, we don't have a lot of forests. We, we never really had a lot. Chris can correct me as to when that change happened. We're, we're a tall grass prairie state in, the, in a big chunk up here. And those nest boxes are critical because trees, dead trees, snags, uh, large trees that could hold, sustain, you know, nesting animals are gone or they're in shortage. So habitat loss, along with what you've heard this week with invasive species um, and other pressures have changed uh, the habitats for our animals. And I think it's really important that we consider our role if we're gonna own property, uh, especially um, if you wanna make a change, make a difference, I think it's our job to make sure we're not neglecting something that we could assist. So I definitely believe that the land should help you address that plan. Many of you on the call may already have a plan. Some people may be on this, um, these calls this week because you're ready to start thinking about a plan. Talk to as many resources as you can. Extension has many people, uh, some sitting right here with you today on the call, and also your, your IDNR conservationists. See what that land was. If you're new to this, get the soils checked. Find out what should have been there because what the soils say will work are your best options for for increasing habitat. Like Tricia was saying yesterday, her talk was amazing and it really is a soil up kind of thing. So if we can att you know, attest to the soil and create those, then it'll make a difference as to who you are building homes for. So you know, we've historically lost these trees, nest boxes are can replicate that. They're kind of a quick fix. The goal would hopefully be to then uh, make a plan that you over years are replacing those nest boxes with what should be there for them naturally. So um, consider that. And as I'd had to throw this in, because nest boxes serve animals who nest in cavities. They don't uh, obviously don't uh, house everybody. So as you are taking care of your property, making habitat changes, don't forget the other types of homes that you can be creating and don't clean up or clean out. You never wanna just clean everything out because you may be losing opportunities, snags, dead trees. If they're not gonna fall and harm yourself or any of your property, those are just perfect places for nests, uh, cavity nesters. Rock piles for hibernaculums. A lot of our reptiles and amphibians like to burrow down in between open spaces for winter. Not everybody loves to uh, help out snakes, but they are an incredible part of the ecosystem. So rock piles, you can even dig up, if you have extra rocks to get rid of, dig a hole in an appropriate place, hopefully where there's some sun shining a lot through the winter and fill that hole with rocks and mound them up. And you may attract um, a lot of things that need that heat in the to get them through the winter and also early early responders like garter snakes they love to come out in january and sun on the rocks and then go back in brush piles and 
the bigger, the better, not if it's going to be a fire hazard, but if, if you want to really help wildlife, they have to have time to rot a little bit. And there are plans out there you can put that people are, are literally Lincoln logging in these brush piles. I just like to see them put up for small uh, songbirds to use through the winter, a lot of your juncos and, and wrens, different animals, uh, birds like that, small birds, and then different mammals will use that. If you are a hunter and you want to increase your rabbit populations, some of those brush piles will help you do that. And of course, you can't leave out your fish. If you have a water uh, situation on your property that's deep enough, you can put uh, structure and house your fish. So I just wanted to throw those in there so we don't forget the rest of them because having that biodiversity on your property is always going to increase uh, your, your amount of beings that want to stay on your space and use your boxes and not leave you with all these boxes and nobody in them, which can happen. So nest boxes can enhance your plan. Uh, you, you, like I said, you may already have that plan and a plan works best, but it needs to be a longevity plan. You don't just go and fix it all at once and you want to set yourself up financially and the most important things. You might listen to someone talk about wetlands and some of the research that came out a few years ago, uh, buckthorn and wetlands. Buckthorn puts off a chemical when it's in the water and, it, and it, it can slow down or completely stop the metamorphosis of salamander and frog eggs. So you may want to get a conservationist or someone who knows more and look at the big picture and prioritize your, your, um, your efforts. And in that, you can then look at putting in nest boxes. Who wants to be there? You may want a certain animal that doesn't fit your habitat. So you may have to do a little more research to get um, whether it's your preferred guest or someone else and you want to design. So this is kind of our agenda list right here. You want to you want to use a research design. We get where I work. I work in a forest preserve and it just drives me nuts when good hearted people build boxes and then randomly put them up in the forest and they don't match the forest um, biodiversity at all or they are like right in front of your face. They definitely don't go high enough for many of them. So you'll hear me complain a little bit about that. And I feel horrible because maybe that was a family with little children, but you definitely don't wanna just throw stuff up. It's, it's, a, it's a good waste of time. And it really, if it's not gonna attract anything but a bunch of um, lovely little rodents, which do feed animals, um, you might be a little disappointed. You wanna construct it to protect those animals. There are definite ways that we're gonna talk about you that you need to construct that box for their, for their health and safety and so that you don't have to replace your box constantly. Uh, and clean and maintain, the hardest one of all. It's so fun to build and put them up and then you have to go back and annually, sometimes biannually, depending on what you wanna use them for, uh, you need to clean those up. So I wanted to throw in an example so say we want to do eastern bluebirds, and I picked the bluebirds because this really was an animal that was basically saved because people got involved, found out what they needed, and created habitat through nest boxes for these animals. They, their numbers were um, affected by loss of habitat, so tree cavities, uh, loss of forest edges, uh, also uh, pesticide use in the sense that when they sprayed for insects, they would eat them, and also predatory invasive species, the thing you hear about all the time, uh, the starlings, which we brought over to help with cutworm, and the uh, English house sparrow. We tried, I shouldn't say we, I don't want anything to do with it, but they tried three times to get house sparrows to take in the United States. And you'd think after one and two, they'd realize they weren't supposed to be here. But the third, third time was a charm and they thought they were going to sell them as pets and um, a few other uses. So yeah, so those birds put a lot of pressure on our bluebirds and we were able to, we were able to recover those numbers and they're not considered uh, in danger and or even a concerned species right now. So what do they prefer? If you do the research, they want that hardwood forest and grassland. Those are two different habitats. So you should read into that and know they kind of like that edge effect where they can have the cover of the trees, but they like to dive down onto an insect. They aren't a fly catcher that will, you know, swoop up and down and grab and then go sit down. They want to see the insect, grab it and go back and eat it. So grass, meadow, pastures, cemeteries, as you see here, they really like shorter grass, not necessarily mowed, but if you're gonna plant for them, maybe a short grass prairie and maybe a patchy short grass prairie at that. Uh, a choice of plants being shorter, uh, that might work. And then they, they like to have perches, places for their uh, fledglings to come out and sit and places for the parents that are higher 
uh, phone, you know, power lines. Um, I about said phone lines. I don't know that there's too many of those anymore, right? Um, anything high where they can kind of overlook their space. They're, they're protective against their box against other bluebirds, um, not always against things that can harm them or their fledglings. So now you're going to create that choice habitat. You're going to create a little more open space with plants around the perimeter. So there's an open space with shorter grasses, maybe a post or some fencing added, just a small you know, portion. Always have to have water. Anytime you research an animal, how far will they travel for water? Rabbits, if you're going to do a brush pile, they need to be within a quarter mile of water. That's where they're going to be preferred. So kind of look into that. Water's always going to be important. Native plants to attract native insects. You have to set the table, the dinner table. So native plants attract more insects, more insects to help that bluebird uh, to continue and to reproduce and cavity nest sites or bluebird boxes. So continuing with the example, there's the the Peterson's bluebird box and the one board bluebird box. One board meaning you use one board to get all your pieces. Both of these work. I, out at the nature center, utilize the one board boxes on a short um, bluebird trail, but the Peterson bluebird box is what I have at home because somebody gave me one. Uh, both have worked. And then a bluebird trail, if you choose uh, to do a bluebird trail, say you have enough property, Bluebird trail, 100 yards apart. They're very territorial. And then uh, a trail is given the, that title by five boxes or more. Now, what we have are, we have seven boxes. We have them spread within that 100 yards because it gives the sparrows and the other tree swallows opportunities to grab boxes that the bluebirds don't want. And sure enough, our best boxes are one, and seven or eight, depending on which box is left that hasn't been vandalized because we are a forest preserve and there's lots of traffic. So this is box two. We did have uh, young in that box, but whenever box one is in good working order, uh, they definitely prefer it. And wouldn't you know box one is within uh, just a small stone's throw from the trees. So it's exactly, it's picking its exact habitat that it, it would by research. So here's my yard. You see the, the Peterson bluebird box on the right and my fence. And there's even some small shrubs sitting there, loose, open. Predators would have a hard time hiding in there. And the fledglings can come out and have a place to sit if they miss the, you know, the ability to get right below to the fence or hop up on it. They can get back in that shrub and then work their way back and forth from the fence. And then this is a uh, native pollinator box. You might recognize the old hose hanger works fantastically to run the water completely off the box and reduces rot. And so I feel like by setting that up and I've been putting in uh, native plants slowly in my, in my one half acre plan. And between those, I feel like the birds are, are set uh, with water supply um, just beyond the field behind my house, there's a, there's a creek. So if they're not bird bathers, uh, you know, in the bird bath, then they can go to the creek and get, get supplement. And what's our goal for any of these nest boxes? Eggs. Those are the bluebird eggs in box one uh, from last year and they were successful and I keep my eye on them and watch for predators to the best of my ability. Um, and that's what you want. You wanna see reproduction. Reproduction means they are successful, which means they're content in their life range you've provided. So this wood projects book has been around for a long time and IDNR put it together and there's some input uh, in there from the, uh, from the heritage, it was natural. It was the Natural Resources Division of Natural Heritage in the day. It was from 1997, but you can still get this. If you go onto the IDNR website, of course, it's, you know they're not printing anymore for cost, but you can download this uh, for free and you can also buy it on Amazon, I double checked. So this gives you those projects and this is where you can find the appropriate size box with the appropriate size openings uh, to build many of the boxes uh, you may be interested in. So there, here's my warning to you. Um, I know Joy's on the call. She'll get a kick out of this. So someone gave me this box and it has a metal plate, National Geographic. I trust National Geographic. I think that's a great plan, but I didn't measure and I have not measured the spaces yet for what size, you know, bats are going to want to be in there. But the interesting thing is, and I couldn't find the tag today, I show it to my master naturalist, the tag for 
this bat box, uh, the bat is our only flying mammal in the, uh, they are a chiroptera, a hand wing, they can truly fly. It was uh, certified by the National Geographic Ornithological Group, which is the bird group. And, I th and when I saw that, I got very concerned about the measurements, which I haven't done yet. So be super careful and double your research on plans to be sure they're, they're actually gonna work because this one um, I would have assumed would have worked and it didn't. Someone gave me this. I just, I put it up because it makes me giggle and they gave it to me and they said, it's a bluebird house. I, I think you just probably heard me say that bluebirds don't like to be within a hundred yards of each other. <laughs> and there are three, four or five, six holes, depending on, you know, um, the, all the sides. And I just find it interesting. So what I did just to test my uh, house wren, house wrens do not like company around them. And I had a house wren in a house wren box. So I, th this was two, three years ago. So I threw the St. The Peter's, um, Peterson's bluebird box up where you saw it. And then I put this out on the spool and I probably shouldn't have because that poor male wren worked for days to fill every box, every hole up with sticks so no one could move in. No one could move in. And uh, he was very stressed about that. But I found it I found it funny that people are buying these and putting them up and they're very cute in a, in a garden art kind of way, but minus the mice and the poor house wren, um, nobody was using it. House wrens, by the way, do build two nests every year. So if you have wren boxes, you may have to clean one out um, midway through the season uh, because they build two nests and the, and the female that chooses to court with that male, she gets to pick which house she wants. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I have example boxes out here at my nature center and my, in the forest preserve I work from the wood projects, uh, book. And I set them out as examples for people to see. And then if they want to build it, I make them a photocopy of the plan and the wren built a nest in the wren box and then in a second box and you know she picked the wren box because the size of the hole matters and he protected both of those boxes until she picked which one she wanted so that was kind of interesting i like it when the science comes true so here's my this is my backyard again um, i had an old apple tree and i was going to cut it down three years ago because it was dying up in it and sure enough the downy woodpeckers decided they loved it so i couldn't cut it down this year, uh, nobody was in it, and I decided it was a hazard for my fence and needed to get it down. And it's, it's not how it's built that matters. Look at this. We build these beautiful nest boxes, and they literally built an egg-shaped hole in a dead tree, right? So we don't have to make it pretty. They don't care what color, you know, that it's really super fancy. It has to be practical. It's the hole size. And sure enough, I measured that hole yesterday because I thought I should check that hole. It's a hair, just a hair. It's not even a, maybe three eighths, one and three eighths because it's been shrinking. That, that hole is actually three years old. And the hole is what, the, what matters and determines uh, who's going to use that box. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I liked seeing the inside. It had a very little bit of um, nesting material, um, but it was all carved out nicely. So we don't want to get too hung up on aesthetics. It's really about what size um, the hole is, how deep is the box if they require that. So as you're creating, um, you could create natural nest cavities and based on your long-term plan, and I would talk to somebody like Chris or um, so if you're not near Chris, you, you know, somebody, an arborist, a conservationist to come out. If you have plenty of trees and you're going to have to thin out trees or reduce some trees um, so they're not competing as much, if you want to sacrifice two or three trees and girdle those and leave them, they have to be a place they're not going to harm you or your, um, you know, buildings, of course, you can actually create a snag and it will be a very strong snag because it, it, it will die, you know, quite quickly from the girdling and it's still um, in good order. It's not, it's not gotten real um, punky. So you girdle it, you want to cut those limbs. I've research told me six, I say six to eight, cut those, those limbs away from the actual trunk because it's harder for the tree to heal that over. And that can create the ability for it to rot and slowly. Remember our land management plan takes time. You're creating a situation where eventually maybe you don't need nest boxes in that particular area by creating natural nest um, 
areas, nest uh, cavities for these animals. So it takes a long time. And one of the suggestions was you could start it even by drilling in. So water goes in maybe and sits, and it starts to decay faster, but you wanna be careful of how big a hole um, think about the animals that you're going to want to attract. If you get too big a hole, they're not going to want it. They're going to feel uncomfortable. Um, make a little bit of a plan. If you don't care who uses it, but you know somebody will, um, go ahead and take the limbs you want. You're not going to want, you know, necessarily need them all, but you might cut them all or many of them. So you have choices that might rot sooner, but be careful. You don't want to cut too large of a limb because you don't want to get somebody that big in your plan. So I had to put Forrest Stump in there because he's right outside my window. And I thought, oh, that's exactly what happened. We cut it off. It couldn't heal and it's all hollowed out. So our neighborhood carver stuck a bear in there. That'd be something to come out and look at on your property, wouldn't it? So here's your construction details. According to what I've found, my resources are at the end of the presentation, three quarter inch wood works best. Untreated. The treated lumber when wet does put off um, toxic vapor and if it's you know gets damp inside all the way through it could harm the animals you're trying to do clearly metal wouldn't work too well because it would heat them heat up too much um, the quarter inch drain holes in the bottom you don't want big holes anywhere because you don't want to encourage a place for snakes to get in snakes love to eat birds and bird eggs um, and you don't want them to, now other animals will crawl right through the hole, I get it, but you don't want to add to that. But you do need some drainage because they are going to have some uh, humidity buildup. In songbird boxes, you're also going to want those ventilation holes near the top, but according to the research, uh, ducks um, don't need those. They just need those drainage holes in the bottom, but they're not needed for any of the waterfowl. And um, they, of course, galvanize screws. You want this to last. You don't want to be reconstructing these constantly. Um, so the continuation of that, you want a way to get in, right? So you have to have a hinge so that you can clean it out easily. Now, I don't know if you've seen raccoons or crows work. The corvids or the crows, blue jays, they're smart. So you're going to have to outsmart them. You don't want the raccoons popping open the door and just munching right in uh, and taking things out. So Keep that in mind that you want to be able, and you can put a screw in there as long as you don't mind climbing up a ladder or carrying to a bluebird trail your screwdriver. I personally like something I can just bend and then move with my hands so I don't have to carry tools when I do ours. Um, the walls of the box should enclose the floor. So the floor should also be recessed up in the box because water tension is a problem. So if the box is getting wet all down the sides, it's not going to go down and go up, right? But if the floor is flush with the bottom of the woods box, it's going to come down, go across those grains and soak if it's a soaking rain and eventually could then go into the box. So we want to keep that um, unavailable for water to penetrate or get to. Some animals are going to want you to put... Um, bedding look that up we put um, we prefer to put wood chips um, something that doesn't uh, decay quickly or get soggy or in the case of like sawdust you don't want small birds to, or small mammals whichever you're putting the box up for you don't want that inhalation that dust their face is going to drop right into it baby birds don't hold their head up very very uh, quickly and they're going to be face planting in whatever you're put in there so try to make sure it's not something and that you know and that's why we clean them right to get out all the dusty decay material and put fresh bedding in some animals don't want bedding in there so you'll have to do a little bit of homework to see which which thing they prefer. As humans, we love to put bedding in. If you remember as a kid, you catch one lightning bug and the jar was mostly grass and sticks for a lightning bug. And the lightning bug really doesn't care about the grass and sticks as much as it just wants to get out, right? So here's an example. Oh, this one, this is right on the road. Um, here at Russell, somebody popped that up and then I found out it was one of the Forest Preserve part-timers and he's very proud of this wood duck box. But look at the floor. And you can even see the edge of the board on the right. It's the water's gonna come right down that and go, the water tension's gonna drag it right into the floor of that box. I don't believe we're gonna get wood ducks in this box. However, if we did, now we have a moisture problem, right? And that's, that's just not okay. And it wouldn't, it's clearly not recessed either, right? So this is, the hole might be the right size. I'm not gonna worry about measuring it because the squirrels are gonna dig this box no matter what. It, that's the one thing when you build a box, you can want for everything 
<laughs> you you've ever wanted for it to be that owl or that flicker or that kestrel or that flying squirrel but it's rental property and whoever gets it gets it right so it's kind of a you have to just kind of be prepared for that so placement location 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 is critical the animal depends on certain things right can you place it where it needs to be how far does it travel for water can you get it in enough sun to meet its needs um you'll find that when you look up uh nest boxes they're going to give you a vertical zone right 10 to 20 feet or uh, five to five to eight feet they want to be at a certain level where they would have been in a small snag in a really tall tree they have preferences so if you really want to get that particular animal in there if you don't care who goes in there it's not as it's not as big a deal but if you really want um that specific animal, you're going to want to look up and figure out what do they want? Is there an unfavorable side to the tree? When, when we are watching animals raise their young, it's usually in the spring. Spring can bring all kinds of crazy cold weather. So sun, southern, southeast, um, maybe not southwest, depending, you know, the jet stream can be vicious. We get big storms from the southeast, from the east here up by the, you know, up by, I'm across out from Chicago. So we get lake effect kind of winds that are crazy in the winter. But how can you warm them up? How can you take care of um, them? And as the heat levels in the box, um, if it's placed in the open sun or their lack of, uh, Joy, who's going to follow this presentation, she's our bad expert. She could tell you better than I. But I know that in one spot, we were, ta it was, we were talking about microclimates. And that if the highest temperature doesn't reach 100 degrees um, in the in July, the bats need that box to sit in in sun. Some of them, you know, depending on the species that you have in your area, to to keep them warm enough. And then, especially in the winter when they're fully hibernating, they even have um, Bat Conservation International. I don't know how Joy feels about them, but they even went so far as to give zones specific colors for the outside of the bat boxes to, to absorb or not to absorb too much heat. So I'm not sure if that research has been proven otherwise, but it makes you realize there are very specific things that these animals want from you. So <laughs> I just had to take this. Seven feet, two inches. I could touch the bottom of that wood duck box and I, they prefer anything above 20 feet. So I have a wood duck box that I look at every day now when I leave work. It's only seven foot, two inches to the bottom. It's built incorrectly. It should rot much sooner than any of the other boxes. And people walk their dogs, people walk by. It's a busy, very near a small town forest preserve. I just don't know how much they're gonna like being in that box. And when you have a small forest preserve near town, you get some, minor vandalism, sometimes major. I don't see this box lasting very long. Um, so we'll see what happens. Stand by for that. But I definitely don't see a wood duck um, utilizing that box. I don't have the heart to tell him. He was pretty excited about the box. So construct to protect your renter. Create ways to stop predators. It's, it can be nearly impossible. Um, but our snakes, once they know where there's a box, um, they can clean them out. Um, raccoons uh, tend to be pretty smart about that as well and other animals. That two inch overhang on like your songbird box, like the bluebird boxes that you saw is really important, a minimum two inches. If you get it too far out, they're gonna have trouble swooping into land, but cats and raccoons are really good at going, hey, there's a hole. I don't have to look at the hole. I just have to get my arm in the hole. And so you wanna keep that two inch forward lip. It also protects uh, the front of the box from rain at least rain that's coming straight down, no perches on the bird nest um, or on the bird boxes because the animals that use perches the most are like our, our invasive species. The sparrows love perches. They'll still get in a bluebird box, but they love perches. Starlings are kind of big and bulky and they can definitely utilize the perch to get into the box and use it or to kill the, uh, to destroy the eggs or kill uh, the babies. Um, so I did read and I put it on here that if for the front of like a, the mergansers and the wood ducks that are gonna fly up and grab the tree and then go in, um, a rough piece of bark, something rough, not necessarily a perch, but something that they can just grip uh, can also help them to uh, have a landing pad. 
the metal wrap guard will slow down mammals and snakes. So it's, you know, you want to make sure they can't jump from the ground and clear it. You want to make sure that they can't climb partway to the bottom of the metal guard and then jump and grab above it. I couldn't find anything um, as to how tall to make that piece of metal, but I would, I've seen raccoons make some crazy leaps. I would say, get it to where they can't get it. You know, they, if they hit it, they hit it from the ground in the middle and make it maybe three feet um, just to be sure they can't be in full climb and jump up and grab above it. And also snakes. Snakes can climb trees. They can go right up a stone wall. But if you have a, something slick like that, they're not going to be able to utilize that in order to go in and slurp down all the eggs that you've been waiting for. Exterior treatments, don't use the treated lumber. You don't need to paint or stain them. These animals don't care what they look like, um, but if you wanna use a wood preservative, that's what every, everybody was saying, that a wood preservative to give your, your box longevity, do it way ahead of time, just so we know that it's aired out and not on the inside, just on the outside. And then they recommended if you mount it against a pole or a tree, whatever side, not necessarily a back, because some, some of your houses, your nest boxes may have an opening on the side, um, but whatever it's up against to treat that part of the box with more coats, just because you're gonna get moisture trapped back there. And that'll help. So cleaning and maintenance, something we don't always want to have to do. So way back when, when you're installing that nest box, if you had to take out your longest extension ladder, cross a bridge over water, schlep it to the middle of the forest, carry the box up as high as you could, hold it, try to get it in the tree, da, da, da. are you really going to want to clean that box? So as much as we'd like to put them exactly where they belong, what's reasonable for your physical safety um, to get back out there and maintain those boxes. Um, I know I had, we had a project with 4-H where they wanted to compare more research. We're always researching, uh, finding new answers and ideas. And they wanted to compare closed barred owl boxes with open topped barred owl boxes to see if that broken off large uh, part of the tree being open at the top, they were using them, would they prefer not to be stuck inside? Uh, so many places around the state uh, took that chance. I got my forest preserve guys to schlep a ladder, two young guys that were like, we'll take it right to where we know the barred owls are. And you know, she picked an old crow's nest. So the boxes remain empty and research says they do whatever the heck they want to do. And she sits out there and calls on her crow's nest and is quite happy. And we're hoping though, by leaving the, the boxes out, she'll get more content that they're there. Uh, and the one little note about owls, owls are very territorial and smaller owls are eaten by bigger owls. And so if you have great horned owls, you may not get barred owls if you get, because of the territorial issue, if you get barred owls, you may not get screech owls. They, they don't want the screech owls around. So you, you want to note what habitat you have. We have bottomlands here and barred owls love to hunt during the day and they love crayfish. So think about what they need and want, and you might be able to attract the, um, the right guy or, or, or girl to your space um, for them to enjoy enjoy their space. There was some research done once and uh, great horned owls would literally fly over a barred owl and just take their head off because they could with, they have a 500 pounds per pressure, 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their grip, uh, the great horned owls. And so they are serious about being territorial. Um, you want to clean out all the debris annually for obvious reasons. Wear a mask. It's not that we, you know, we're many of the things a bird would have are going to be host specific, but you don't need all that dust and debris of broken down organic matter in your lungs. So wear a mask, take some gloves, um, clean it out. You'll do a better job if you're not worried about all the dust and stuff. Clean it out. If it's um, check the drain holes, pop, you know, take something like a screwdriver up there to push debris out of the drain holes. Just get it ready. You can leave them open. 
to keep other things in them, especially if you're doing like the bluebird boxes, but you know what, they rot really quick that way. So what I do with my bluebird boxes, I get them all cleaned out in the fall. I shut them and I get black um, corks, plugs from the hardware store. I have a set that I keep in a Ziploc bag and I grab them and I go down there and I clean them and then I just pop those in. And then the box looks like it has an open hole because it's black and the vandals don't go through and pull out whatever they, they just think they're empty and that's a black hole. Um, so that's something you could do, but you want to check for rotten wood, loose screws. Um, if there's mold, you do need to address that. We don't want it. it number one, it'll rot your box quickly and, uh, it, it's good to get rid of that, let it dry really well. And if you do it in the fall, then it's not going to be something you do in the spring and have maybe a mild, you know, a mild soap solution in there. Or if it has to have a, a mild bleach solution, you definitely want that to air out. Um, they can't smell it. Um, birds don't, except for birds like vultures, they don't have um, a very, um, uh, very good olfactory lobe, so they can't smell, uh, which makes sense because the primary diet for great horned owls is skunk. Clearly they can't smell, right? Um, so you want to clean it out just for their health. They're not going to notice. I had someone tell me, well, I'm going to make all my nest boxes out of cedar because it smells good and they'll like that. And they said, oh, you might want to save your money and just do some wood treatment on some pine. It's, they'll last longer physically if you want to do that. Right now you can't get lumber um, with the lumber shortage, but he, you know that might be part of your plan is to have exactly what you need ready when the, when the lumber market gets replenished and when the prices drop, right? Um, that would be a good idea. And the, um, I think I have it, maybe I have it later. Um, let's see, we talk about, about roosting in the winter. So this was my bluebird box that I showed you earlier. Notice uh, it was not a, a bluebird at all because it's all sticks. It was my little house wren who actually beat up a, a house sparrow for that nest this year. It was an interesting thing to watch. And they nested in there. You can see the droppings um, down here on the bottom. And that's the wood board underneath that's recessed up in there. So it actually stays pretty clean. The interesting thing is, so when we're talking about biodiversity, wrens are, are known to grab um, you can kind of see there's some spider webs up in the back. Wrens are known to grab spiders, not to eat them, but to put them in with them. And then the spiders eat the insects that could bother the birds. So I think that's a fantastic little uh, self ecological service that they provide for themselves. So having a, a diverse area in your, in your conservation plan, having more spiders that might serve uh, this little guy for sure. You can see this box has a screw and I just, uh, it just screws in and holds the holds the door shut. The shut uh, the doors drop forward on these Peterson's boxes, so that's kind of neat. But it was funny because it he lived there and filled all the other boxes in the yard to the top. <laughs> so this is the part I was I was wanting to talk about. So after you clean and do any repairs, you can change your nest box into a roosting box which means it's not for nesting. You don't have to put any material in if you don't want to. Animals will utilize a box to get out of the out of winter. Woodpeckers often this time of year, I start to get all the phone calls about woodpeckers pecking on cedar sided homes. They're not they're not drumming and trying to attract a mate. They're trying to make a hole for winter. Um, they're trying to make another space to get out of the weather. So if you want to, you can plug the holes in the bottom and the top if you have vent. You can make it tight except for the except for the entrance hole. And you will get animals that'll stay in there. Who knows who? You're going to get mice. You're going to get birds. You're going to get, all, you know, who knows who's going to, you know, take that box over. But then you have to evict them in the spring. And if you get mice, they don't like to be evicted. Mice take over. If a bluebird would come into that box before you got out there, a mouse will take down a bluebird coming in there uh, because they don't want to give up the, the house they've gained. One of the suggestions also was to invert that front of that box, you know, your, your hole for the openings at the top, warm air rises. And so there's going to be wind coming in the hole no matter what, but they suggested uh, flipping the door. I don't think that I would do that, but um, flipping the door so the cold air is coming in, well, it's going to come in right on their bodies. So just a suggestion in some of the, uh, some of the plans that I wanted to share with you that you could do. I wouldn't do it because it's going to put wear and tear on the, on the holes where your screws are at, and then they're going to loosen up sooner also. Uh, but if necessary, you could add roosting boxes and plug those during nesting season and open those in the winter. So each box is only getting cleaned once 
I just thought of that. That wasn't in the original plan, but you could do that. They found male Eastern bluebirds just piled in boxes to keep warm. Uh, so you never know. So I had to throw this in. It's a picture from my camera from this April. So I have a neighbor who is a wonderful um, adult raised on a farm man. He and his wife live next door and he does not appreciate squirrels at all. I don't mind, you know, hunting, you know, when people hunt during legal season, I, that's, that's important, right? We have, we have seasons for animals. He shoots squirrels all year long. And I, I, as a, a little slightly urban space on the edge of, of agriculture, I like my squirrels. Some of you are going, oh, that's crazy, but I do. It gives me something to watch. So I put up this owl box. It's a screech owl box. And I put up this owl nesting box to give the squirrels a place to stay. So they stay out of his yard and they get shot a lot less, et cetera. Well, when I first put it up, uh, in the fall of 2017, wouldn't you know, I got a screech owl. Couldn't believe it. I was so excited. It stayed through the December bird count and then the squirrels ran him out. So now I have squirrels and I was mad at the squirrels because it ran out an owl, but I clearly had enough um, habitat temporarily till the squirrels ran him out. And ever since then, it's been nothing but um, a squirrel nesting box and that's fine. But this was a snowstorm. Look at the date. April 17th this year, we had a pretty sticky, wet snow happen. And they definitely, those youngsters had never seen snow. They were newborns and, you know, that year, this year, born this year. And they were very concerned and very interested in the snow. So that's also kind of fun, right? When you get to watch these animals, um, you can put up um, game cameras and things. People do that. Uh, and you can also go on to, there's plenty of um, nest box cams out there. Um, Cornell has some, a lot of places have them. There's a, a pair of great horned owls down in Savannah, Georgia that the cameras are on. Of course, the eagles in Iowa. It's, it's interesting. And if you had your own, that would be really fun to, to be able to see. So I put up a bat box. Notice there's the opening is below because the bats will fly up and their thumbnails, they don't have nails on they have fingers like you and I, but they only have thumb nails and they'll fly up and hook those nails and crawl up in that box. That little middle um, opening line is for ventilation to circulate ventilation. And Joy's experiences, she'll be able to tell you if that box um, still works today at all, or if it's not something that's as functional as research has found. And then you have your Martins, right? So any of your Martins, Swallows, Swifts, the thing that you have here is a 24 hour ecological service. Both of these boxes provide homes for animals that eat tons of insects. So you could actually reduce your chances of getting a disease from a vector like a mosquito. And you could do your service to others by having these boxes and reducing the number. And it might be nice if you have a marshy area where the mosquito population is excessive to uh, add these boxes in the appropriate places. Um, I just think, I just think if that it, I think it's our job to make places for um, these animals that can help us reduce disease. As you you know, see how fast mosquitoes can transfer and bring things our way. And migratory birds, you know, um, they bring in ticks and things too. I get it, but the, the mosquitoes can get to people a lot quicker. So we want to do our part there. All right. So here's what something I added that I think you'll be sorry if you don't start doing this if you don't already especially with nest boxes. You're gonna say, oh, remember the year? No, you won't <laughs> because you're gonna have different, different renters, right? So it would be really helpful to you and to others. You know, yesterday, Tricia was talking about that national uh, phenology network. I'd never seen that. But what, it's, what it does is you're providing kind of a critical trends analysis of a specific habitat, a specific box. You're, it's your own research project. And it's fun because if you pick and you could go on to that National Phenology Network and get an idea of what things they collect and make this list different than what I've just threw up here on the slide. But if you can get this kind of information and keep track, you will see things maybe ebb and flow on your own property for the better, sadly, maybe for the worse. Um, as populations change, how can you, how can you manage differently to increase uh, the biodiversity? It may come down to more invasive species management. It can, may come down to more girdling a few more trees. The, the best part is you have a record and it shows that you're serving more than just yourself in this world. 
some of the resources I, I use, these are the main resources that I used for this presentation. And if you look at the bottom, this one will keep you very enamored. And on nestwatch.org, they've, uh, Purnell's done an amazing job. They have a lot of information, including a troubleshooting guide. I get lots of state questions on wildlife uh, as a, for extension, and they have a troubleshooting guide for nest box landlords. That's what it's called. So if the eggs are pecked, it was probably this bird or that bird. If the eggs are completely missing and there's no sign of anything, probably a snake went in and swallowed them up. So it's kind of, kind of interesting because then you can kind of figure out what's, what's causing some of the issues. It could be that, um, that there's an, an ant issue, there could be a pesticide issue, but that, that's a nice, it's a nice site. It's, it's really well done and it will give you so much information. You'll spend your whole winter making nest boxes. Um, start now asking neighbors if they have scrap wood laying around they don't want before they figure out how valuable it is. That's what I'm gonna do for my projects because wood prices right now are double if you can even get them. A couple additional resources. This Reading the Landscape of America by Mae Watts is fantastic. And it goes back to what I was telling you, you know, what is the land telling you it should be? Try not to force it to be something it's not because one, it's not fair to the soil and two, you'll be much more successful if you read that landscape. So this is a book I think that, um, that anybody would enjoy in our field and, and wanting to do conservation. This book is fantastic for that ecological service idea that we talked about with Bats and Martins. It has a lot of stories um, about, it gives, it gives um, an amount, a money figure to the ecological uh, services that wildlife uh, give us. And it makes you kind of humbled. It really does. My favorite is the vultures in India and the cost in the billions as they started losing their vultures. Um, they had to track down, you know, what it was. And it it actually turned out they had switched antibiotics for their cattle. And when their cattle die, they lay them out for the vultures to eat. And that antibiotic was actually killing their vultures. They had three or four species, but they depend on their vultures for so much more. And I'll leave it at that for you to, to nab that book and read it. It's, it's excellent. Of course, Nature's Best Hope, the second book from Doug Talame. Doug Talame is an entomologist at the University of Delaware. This this is a book that many of us in the field, we, this is what we've been, we've been uh, pushing for years. Somebody finally put it in print um, and said, yes, this is what has to happen. But he gives you research and, and not just telling you we need to, we can save this planet one, one track of land at a time, even if it's my backyard, we just have to do it. And we have to make an, an attempt to get that to happen. And just being on this call, and on this week-long conservation series says something about all of you having an interest and a innate need to do something different and to help out. And with that, I just think this red-headed woodpecker who is one of my favorites and one of the most delicate species in the woodpecker family. I think it looks fake, it's such a good photo. A friend of mine took that photo, um, but I'll leave it at that, Aaron. That's the end of me going on and on. Hey, thanks so much, Peggy. Um, We've had a lot of questions come in and I'm going to encourage anybody else that has a question for Peggy to go ahead and put it in the chat box. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, mm -hmm. We had a couple questions, Peggy, about different um, nest raiders. Mm -hmm. So we had a question about mink and a question about raccoons. And I, I know you talked about the metal flashing, um, but mm -hmm. anything else that people can do to uh, discourage predators? And you know, I think <clears throat> if you have those animals, first be, be pleased that you have some biodiversity, number one. Number two, go to the wildlifeillinois.org. It's wildlifeillinois.org. It used to be the universities living with Illinois wildlife, which will still get you there. But first and foremost, find out the legal um, ramifications, find out what you can legally do and you may have, you can get a nuisance permit. If you don't want to take them out, as we say, then you may be feeding them. Predators like mink are incredible hunters because they can climb, they can swim. Um, I know that doesn't help you, but first and foremost, please do it legally um, because that's, that's why there's laws in place to, pr we protect our wildlife and manage our populations with laws. Um, and then, if you can and, you, and you're willing, you may have to reduce the population of those animals on your property to get a balance that's more appropriate for what you're trying to do. Uh, mink are 
um, the mink come out of the river here and they'll they'll climb the they'll chase the chipmunks straight up the tree you know right at the bird feeders it's it's they're amazing um but that's really all i can tell you because they're just too good at it they're just they're just amazing their toolbox is insane um you know the snakes can't climb up anything slippery but mink can jump and climb um if the flashing's long enough you know that metal wrap um that's maybe your best bet but if it's a bluebird box or a, a, sh a short space, they're just going to jump for it if they hear noises. If they can't, I doubt that a mink could make it into some of these smaller nesting bird holes. They're probably going to go for duck boxes and, and bigger openings, but not much. They don't need much. Okay, great. Um, somebody had a question about bluebird boxes and, and putting them up on trails or in rows. Um, basically, just reiterating that you know they are territorial. So, can you kind of hit those? recommendations again about mm -hmm. spacing for bluebird boxes so if you only want bluebirds and you want to tackle checking those on a regular basis 100 yards apart right if you just want bluebirds i always recommend people put up the extra boxes in between because they'll separate themselves and go you know as far away as they choose to and maybe they won't go a full 100 yards in your space but the other boxes give you the opportunity to let the green tree swallows, which are beautiful. They love and, and they utilize our boxes here on the, on the road. We don't allow uh, the English house sparrows to stay. We clean them regularly enough that we pull their nests out constantly to deter them, especially starting right away in the spring. We try to stop that. But if there's green tree swallows, we, we keep those because they're going to be in a box that's, that's close to a bluebird and the bluebird won't go after the green tree swallow. The bluebird will usually just, usually, um, just defend, uh, against the other bluebirds, which then go down further down the trail. Okay, great. Uh, somebody asked about the suitability of pallet wood for nest boxes. Are there any problem using pallet wood for nest boxes? Well, after listening to Trisha's thing yesterday, I wouldn't even like, I wouldn't tell her about it. <laughs> it hopes that what if the pallets didn't get checked? Um, you know, I would say if you can make it safe for the birds and sealed, again, the birds like a specific size to a specific, you know, shape. And I'm not sure the pallet width is going to be big enough. Now, if you want to try to attract something uh, different, they might be big enough for a wren, uh, small, small birds, uh, as long as you can drill the hole without shattering it. Um, the, the rough edges aren't going to matter. You know, they're a little usually not perfectly smooth. Uh, but the, again, you just got to make sure that you're not allowing water to get in, you know, making it to size. You wouldn't want to build a um, an owl box out of skids because you're going to have all those seams and all those seams are going to let moisture in. Um, and yeah, you could seal them, but can you seal them safely? And will the seal stay in the exterior world? Stuff like that. You could definitely try um, and see what you can make and, and then keep a phenology. My skid box, <laughs> um, I don't know that you'd want to call it skid row, but that'd be kind of cute. Um, but that'd be kind of fun to, to do your own little research project and then be able to say, you know, everything about it, where you put it, what it was for, the whole size, what came, you could make them just for small mice. You could have a mouse, you know, box, they would use it, guarantee you. Okay, great. Um, we had somebody ask a question about um, how do we go about discouraging people from, you know, feeding people foods at nesting boxes um, instead of just feeding wildlife, but instead encouraging habitat or managing for better habitat for them more education. Yeah, I feel like that's all that all of us talk about. You know, I, I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday. You don't have to feed the birds. I did a program last night for a, for a group that wants to feed everything. <clears throat> you know, they, they know how to feed themselves. And how do we know um, when, you know, definitely we don't need to feed things in the summer because these animals have things that they prefer. And if we alter the population because we're hyper feeding, um, that could work against your, your overall balance and your biodiversity. Uh, you could, if it's something where you see it happening, you could create an educational, don't, you know, you don't want to put up, don't feed the, you know, don't feed the birds people food. That's, you know, that's not going to work. You know, you, don't, you have to be very cautious with your education, but you could develop a small sign. I'm not sure of the situation you're in, uh, but something that just says, you know, our animals are being fed by nature. Extra food is not necessary, nor is it a healthy, you know, 
carbohydrates turn to sugar. <laughs> um, they don't really feed people. That's why I like them. Um, but yeah, you could, I, I always want to say educate, you know, politely and cautiously educate. I get a guy that wants to feed the deer out here and he wants to feed them. And the IDNR does not want them fed because he puts, he puts corn down. And of course now they, not now, but when he was doing it, they knew when he'd show up and they'd gather. And when they gather, they share saliva. When they share saliva, they share disease. And we don't want that for that population. But he truly felt, truly felt he was keeping them alive through the winter being that they couldn't do it without his care. And that took me two years of slow, constant explanation, um, getting him to stop doing that. Um, they don't need that. And it was actually more harmful to feed them. So it's, it's, a, it's a long education process, a news release in the paper, um, you know, saying, hey, you know, one of the things that happens is this, and this is why it doesn't, it isn't helpful. You definitely want to turn it to where it's more harmful than helpful so that because they they think they're helping, they truly do. Okay, we had a question about the um, the bee hotels. You know those mm -hmm. native bee the habitats. Native. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wondered if um, if you have a big collection, is that more of a problem for pests and diseases? So is it is it better to have smaller um, mm -hmm. smaller kind of units spread out uh, for those? Um. I don't know that answer. I have a, uh, those small ones. And I even found those really old school bricks that are really long and skinny with the tiny holes. And I propped them up in my yard against a tree and they took those too. So the other thing, the part of that that you got to think about is maintenance. <laughs> they require maintenance too. Um, upkeep, you don't clean them out because you could have insects, you know, our native insects lay one egg they provision that with either a pollen basket or a neutralized, they use a neurotoxin to neutralize an insect and they seal it in those little tubes with mud. You may have them back in the back of those tubes and then they slowly use them. But when you get a tube that's mudded over on the front, once there's a hole in it and that animal has come out, that tube needs to be drilled back out or replaced. So they too are a nesting box that require work. However, that said, I have a four foot by six foot um, insect hotel that I had an Eagle Scout make for me. And it, um, I just don't see it being a disease issue because right, I mean, only because I don't know of any diseases that our native insects are sharing and they don't colonize our, our honeybees, our European non-native bees, they, they touch each other, right? They're colonizing. So when they get a disease, they all get it similar to you know, people get very worked up about bats having rabies. Well, it's not that they always have rabies, but when one gets it and they and they colonize, they're together, then they all do get sick. Our native insects do not colonize. They all have their own apartment. So they aren't touching and, and working around each other. They're utilizing their own compartment. So I say, do another test, do it how it best fits you that you will maintain them and not just have a lot of rotting boxes. 